Good evening, folks, family, friends, loved ones, enemies, frenemies, wizards, witches, muggles, mudbloods, people, Middle Earth, to another episode of Disguise Coverage, part, of course, of the Cover One Sports Network, and the only podcast in existence that gives you an equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. I am your host, Anthony Prohaska. Find me on Twitter at pro underscore underscore ant. That's pro, two underscores, A-N-T. Find me on the TikTok as well, same exact handle, pro, two underscores, A-N-T, in tonight's episode of Disguise Coverage on the back end of the show. We're going to dive into some stock up, stock down for the Buffalo Bills on a player level, position grouping level, team level, coming out of a victorious performance for the Buffalo Bills against the Green Bay Packers, but one that has left some Bills fans uh, with a bit of a sour taste in their mouth based on some performances on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. So we're going to jump into some stock up and stock down towards the back end of this episode, really kind of analyzing that and diving into that piece. But on the front end of this episode, what we're going to have is some insight into the New York Jets in previewing the matchups and the X's and O's scheme and structure, all that kind of stuff of this week's upcoming game, the battle in the AFC East between the Buffalo Bills and the New York slash New Jersey Jets. And to do that, I'm going to bring on Mr. Zach Rosenblatt from The Athletic, someone whose work I genuinely respect. Zach, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, thanks for uh, fitting me in to jump on and add some insight into the Jets and talk about this game. No problem, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. Just in case people don't know you or aren't familiar with your work and what you do, you also have a sweet podcast. I love the Can't Wait name. I love the Bart Scott line. That's dropping the intro. It's fantastic. Just in case people aren't familiar with your work, let them know what you do, who you are, where they can find you, and all that stuff. Yeah, cover the Jets for the Athletic, like you said. Just started this season. Covered the Giants for two years before that. Eagles two years before that. So bounced around a little bit, but um, for different companies. Uh, Different company, I should say. (laughs) Um. Yeah, and then, yeah, I'm on Twitter at Zach Blad, Z-A-C-K, and have the Can't Wait podcast, and I also am pretty active on Instagram, too. That's Zach Blatt, NFL, so. Very nice. Get your plugs yeah. in. Appreciate you. We'll jump right into it because I know you're a busy guy. I want to get you out. Let's start with Zach Wilson, a quarterback coming into his second year, but still only 18 games in, so still, like, kind of getting that rookie tag in some circles and in some ways coming off of a – less than ideal performance against the New England Patriots, especially considering the loss of Brees Hall and more being heaped onto his shoulders at this point in terms of making this offense go and where, you know, he needs to take them in order to help them function. What are your thoughts on Zach Wilson in year two, but still kind of into that rookie, you know, landscape and window, who is he at this point? Where is he in your estimation in terms of seeing his overall progress and evaluation? Yeah. I mean, this, this last game was pretty alarming. Honestly, he, uh, you know, he threw three interceptions. All three of them were – they got progressively worse, I would say. You know, the first one, he threw off his back foot, uh, and it was well over the head of Ty Johnson, the running back. Mm. The second one, he was trying to escape pressure and just kind of aired it out. He was trying to throw it to the sideline, he said, and he just didn't get it there, and that was easily picked off. The third one, he was trying to, again, evade pressure, and instead of getting rid of the ball and nobody was open, he just threw it to nowhere, and they easily picked it off. And those last two are the biggest concerns because he's been really bad when he's pressured, mm-hmm. like the worst in the league bad. He's been good when the pockets kept clean, but the offensive line is kind of an issue right now, so that's not going to change. So he, he hasn't like shown progress in the areas that he needed to yet, and that's the the concern. You know, in that four-game winning streak, he played mistake, mostly mistake-free football. I, mm-hmm. I think, you know, statistically he didn't make throw turnovers. There were, there were plays that maybe should have been picked off mm-hmm. and things like that, so – there's concerns. There's flat. There's been flashes of his talent. You know, the fourth quarter against the Steelers, where they mm-hmm. uh, came back and won. He looked really good. He was nearly perfect in that quarter. Since then, he's like done his job. And then this last week was concerning. And you know, they, the Jets coaching staff has used the excuse of like the defense that they've played. The Packers defense is in their mind good. The Broncos <laughs> defense is is the best pass defense mm-hmm. in the league. Yeah. Patriots defense. That I mean, but what, however, they're however they are. Bill Belichick's good against young quarterbacks. Um, so they've used that excuse, but at a certain point, you have your as a quarterback, you have to overcome that. And he's the number two overall pick. And um, so there's a lot of pressure on him right now. Tough stretch coming up with the Bills, obviously. Then you have the Patriots again after the bye. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if the, the problem right now is that they have enough talent to like win football games and compete with pretty much anybody, maybe not the Bills, but they have the talent to compete with teams. So they can't have a quarterback who is losing games for them. If he's if he can be average. They can they'll they can sneak into the playoffs if he's below average they're in trouble and and uh, you wonder like how long his leash is kind of thing. 
Yeah, that's fair. And, you know, you mentioned his rating when pressured. So out of the 39 quarterbacks with at least 20% of dropbacks in the league this year, he's 38th out of those 39 quarterbacks in passer rating when pressured. He has a 54.9% completion percentage overall, which is tied for last among those 39 quarterbacks. And you mentioned, you know, that four game winning streak and how we kind of played mistake free football in that regard. And then the turnovers and decision making and just the the indecision seemed to really creep up again um, when I was diving into the tape for this past game against the Patriots. Do you think that, you know, is it, and you mentioned him not progressing the way they'd like him to, do you think it's more of a not progressing or do you think it's like, how much is regression versus not progressing? Do you think like this is, he's still just kind of where he is. He's still like rookie quarterback level Zach Wilson, and he's not making that improvement that you need to see, or do you think he's taken a step back? It's a good way to ask the question. Um, I, I do think it's it's the the latter, that he just hasn't made progress. I think he's kind of stuck in the same spot. Okay. Um, uh, you know, and it's not just the turnovers. Like, I, I think there's been some clips that have gone on, on Twitter. There's, like, plays where he's so set on going to his first read yes. that, um, like, it – he doesn't even like check to see if the guy's open or if things change since the, what he saw. Pre- he seems to predetermine everything. He's yeah. like, I'm going here. And then if he can get there, right. cool. And if not, you can see him just almost freeze. Like he's like, yeah. Oh, either he still goes there anyway, or he immediately starts to try and scramble. Yep. Um, so he's like missed guys that have been open. I think, you know, Garrett Wilson, I think is absolute stud. He's been, he's been getting pretty open. I think, I, I think there's like a ESPN stat that he's like one of the like five most open receivers kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, um, how, I don't know how they evaluate that, but um, so yeah, I, I don't, you know, maybe they're not open every play, but no, nobody's gonna be open every play. And you know, he does deserve credit for his ability to evade pressure has saved a lot of like sacks. Yeah, which wouldn't when like Joe Flacco was in there, but Joe Flacco would probably be better at getting rid of the ball quickly, kind of thing. Like he, I think there, there's there's a stat I don't have in front of me, but when when Zach Wilson throws the ball in less than two and a half seconds. I think he's like one of the top like 15 quarterbacks in terms of like mm-hmm. EPA, which speaks uh, to him being able to go to that like predetermined first yeah. read almost. And then, and then when it's more than that, which is most of the time, uh, I think he's like either number one or two or three, like in the other two are like Lamar Jackson and uh, another scrambling quarterback. Uh, like when it's more than that, he is um, one of the worst quarterbacks, if not the worst. So it's not great. <laughs> it's a problem. And it's like stuff like when he's in the pocket, he, he has good grades and good stats when he's out of the pocket. He doesn't. And for a quarterback that spent so much time outside of the pocket, it's a problem. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to be solved this year. So I, I think that they're, they're probably going to try and as much as they can over that four game winning streak, they just like simplified the playbook and what they asked him to do to the point where he couldn't really like kept him from making mistakes kind of thing. You don't want to have to like do that. You want to be able to have a quarterback that can help you win. Yeah. But you know, for this season, that might be what they have to do, especially when you're going against a team like the bills and the, mm the Patriots again and you know they're going to go against some teams like the Vikings who have pretty good defense and Seahawks defense has looked better and yeah I don't know he's got he's got there's like challenge the Dolphins uh at the end of the season like there, there's challenges on the schedule coming up and I'm it's gonna be interesting to see how he handles it and then how he handles it and also going along with that word challenges Brees Hall was having a phenomenal year like the, doing it on the ground, doing it in the receiving game, the explosion. I mean, just that that touchdown against the Packers, him improvising off of that, you know, yeah. he's supposed to pitch it to Wilson, recognizes that it's not there, cuts it up and just houses it and outruns like the whole defense almost by himself when he realizes Quay Walker's over pursuing. He goes down. That's a big blow. And how much does that impact this Jets offense? Obviously it does, but how does that change the game plan and how they operate? You know, part of that four game win streak. Zach Wilson's playing mistake-free football. And like you mentioned, I feel like less was on his plate because things were a little simpler because the offense wasn't – it wasn't completely going through Brees Hall, but he was a significant portion, and he's breaking off explosive plays in the pass and in the run. That aspect is gone. You're trying to incorporate James Robinson into this offense. There's some weirdness going on with Elijah Moore, which we'll get to in a minute. But what do you think this Jets offense does as they start to move forward without someone like Brees Hall? Like how does this offense change, and where do they try to go? Yeah, I mean that's the big question because I mean they really had start they they'd become a run first team. I think that's kind of what even the Jets always wanted to do coming from that 49ers background. Yeah. And Brees, you know, he just had an ability that every time he touched the ball, he could score. He was one of those like special talents like that. Yeah. And he was starting to get into his own. It was unfortunate the injury that happened. Um but you like even the last game, I think Michael Carter is a solid NFL running back. <laughs> but there are plays where you could see he gets like a 10-yard run 
but if he had a little more explosiveness like Brees Hall, like that's probably a 30 yard run or a touchdown. Mm. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how they handle that because um, this is built to be a running team. And I don't think either James, like James Robinson is again, he's a solid running back. He's a guy that's got more likely to get you like three to five yards a carry than mm. you know, a guy that's going to break off a 30 yard run. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, I think their, their hope is they can grind teams down, run the clock, get first downs, run, run, run short passes, you know, get, get, guys like Garrett Wilson, the ball in space and make plays after the catch Braxton Berrios. Like mm-hmm. they like to manufacture touches for guys like that. You would think Elijah Moore in theory would be involved with that, but there's, and we'll talk about that obviously. So yeah. There. Um, but yeah, so I, th- I think that they're kind of going to be forced into being like a, a team that runs a lot of 12 personnel. They have two tight ends. They like, they're going to run the ball a lot, but when the running game's not getting going and you saw this the first three weeks when Joe Flacco was a quarterback, they were falling behind, so they wound up throwing the ball more than anybody in the league. If they, I mean, these the Bills, you assume they're gonna. I mean, who knows? NFL is weird, but you assume they're gonna fall back, fall behind, and so they're gonna have to start throwing the ball. You can't do only short passes and run the ball against the Bills if you want to have a chance against them, unless you take a lead in the beginning, I guess. Fair. Um, so it, it's uh, it's gonna be a challenge, and it's gonna be interesting to see how they handle out. This last week, they didn't run the ball enough, I would say, uh, especially because they were leading for a bunch of the game mm-hmm. and. Maybe they just decided the running game wasn't being effective. I don't know. Um, but I, the, the main thing I would recommend is just getting Garrett Wilson the ball as much as you can. I, I mean, teams are going to scheme against him, especially, you know, as Corey Davis is injured. Uh, yeah. But I, I think you just make him the number one weapon in the offense. He's been sweet this year, and he, he was my wide receiver one coming into this year for his, his route running, his suddenness, the sharpness in his routes, and just what he can do after the catch. He's had a good start to this rookie campaign and has been a real bright spot for this offense, even with what he was doing before Zach Wilson uh, came back from injury and what he was doing with Flacco. Like you saw, Flacco was a veteran, and I think it speaks to – you would watch those games and it was like Flacco was just like, where's Garrett Wilson? Where's 17? Where's 17? Like he earned that trust from Flacco early on and um, has continued to play well as Zach Wilson's come in. You mentioned the two tight end pieces. So yeah, the Jets offense uh, has been in 12 personnel, 19% of the time so far this year. So one out of every five snaps. And again, makes sense. Like I like Conklin. I like Uzama um, in terms of what they can do and they can both function in the run and the pass. And then also, again, that ties into the receiver piece here. They go a little more 12 person now because of the wonkiness going on at the position. They've had some injuries. They've had some ups and downs and inconsistencies. And then again, you mentioned in theory, Elijah Moore should be the one or the two worst case scenario, like paired with Garrett Wilson on this team, tremendous skill set. <clears throat> What's going on with this whole Elijah Moore saga? Is it, do you think it's on him? Is it a coaching staff issue? Is it a fit issue? Like it just, it, anytime you have someone with that level of talent who isn't getting on the field yeah. when they are, they're just not producing it combined with all like the weird, uh, you know, interview moments after games, it obviously brings up questions, but what's going on with Elijah Moore in, in this offense? You know what? I, my read, I don't think effort is an issue with him necessarily. Like, you know, some guys get frustrated and, and they stop trying. I don't think that's going on with him. I think what happened is they were very high in him and they're sitting in the draft. Garrett Wilson's there at number 10 and they're like, we just want to get this player. We think is going to be an absolute star and mm-hmm. we'll figure out how everything fits together after the fact. Um, but what happened was because Garrett Wilson's so talented, you want to put him in his best possible position over anybody yes. else. And so he's getting a lot of the reps in the slot. They're manufacturing touches out of the backfield. Um, they're getting him out in space. And so because he's taken the reps that maybe Elijah Moore would have gotten last year, Elijah Moore is now outside running mostly go routes, they're throwing the ball to him down the field. He's he's athletic, but he's only like 5'10", 5'11". He's not a Garrett Wilson level athlete. He's not going to win the 50-50 balls usually. Um, and it's not like you know, Zach Wilson's been particularly good throwing the ball down the field. They haven't really even tried. Uh, so I think it, it just turned into a place where I don't really know how they see how he fits in in this offense, which you know, it was unfortunate because, you know, there was like a six-game stretch last year where he looked really, really good. Yes. Um, and I think I, – I, and, you know, you get his frustration because he's not getting the ball and, and all that stuff. You, I mean, you don't love the way he went about it, blowing up in practice, and demanding a trade and all that stuff. Yeah. But – I don't know. I, I think you have to find a way to incorporate him because, you know, he's he's a more dynamic player than like Braxton Berrios. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he only played 10 snaps last week, only ran routes on seven of them. And I think he, he did have more reps in the slot than on the outside in that game. But he only got targeted once, so and he barely played, so it didn't amount to anything. So I'm curious to see if they start giving him more reps in the slot. I feel like Garrett Wilson might be better on the outside than Elijah Moore would be, but you also just want to mm-hmm. just – 
you want Garrett Wilson to be in position to make plays. And I think Denzel Mims has actually looked pretty good the last two yeah. weeks uh, on the outside. He's a good blocker. So I don't know. It's I, I thought they should have traded Elijah Moore personally just because it seems like I don't really know how he fits in anymore. But yep. now you have him and you want to use your players. Uh, and especially now without Brees Hall, you need to find guys who can make plays. So I don't know. It's, it's going to be very fascinating to see how they handle this the rest of the year. Let's switch to the other side of the ball, the bigger and maybe at this point, like lone bright spot for this Jets team, the defense, which has just made a significant turnaround from what they were last year. And even in the early parts of this year, struggling against Baltimore and struggling against the Cleveland Browns, they come into this game eighth overall in DVOA, and that's also eighth against the pass and eighth against the run. You're seeing them really be able to mix up coverages on the back end. This front four has Quinn and Williams has just taken off. He's tied for eighth in the entire NFL with pressures, but he's first among all interior defensive linemen. You're getting quality snaps out of Franklin Myers. Carl, Carl Lawson looks like he's returning well from that injury last year. He's giving you some juice. Huff is giving you some burn off the edge. Vinny Curry's making plays. A real quality group up front. And then C.J. Mosley looks like he's getting back to Baltimore. C.J. Mosley. Quincy Williams is shooting the gap. Like This is a versatile, violent aggressive defense for the Jets and honestly like a legitimately like quality strong group what do you credit for the improvement of this Jets defense in year two under Robert Sala is it is it just as simple as like well they brought in DJ Reed and they drafted Sauce Gardner and now they're healthier and like things are working out or is it a credit to this coaching staff you know for really turning around a unit that was quite poor last year I, mean, I think it's a combo of all those things but I think more than anything it's talent and it's health would be the two things um you look at what you mentioned. They brought in DJ Reed and Sauce Gardner, which is huge because the corners were a major weakness last year. And I think you have two arguably top 10 corners in the NFL this mm-hmm. year so far. I mean, those those guys have been stellar. I mean, DJ Reed doesn't get the same pub. I think he's been Pro Bowl level. Mm-hmm. And Sauce, as everybody has just heard him, I mean, it's it's hard not to hear about him because of the personality and the name. But yeah. he's, been, he's been amazing. Like, and, and it's going to be interesting. I think he, he said today he thinks he's going to see Gabe Davis a lot. I'm sure he'll see some digs. Okay. Um it's going to be a real challenge for him for sure. He's handled all the challenges he's had so far. He covers the tight end really well. Anyway, yeah, he does. Have, the way the way their the way their defense works, they they don't blitz. They have they do four man rushes most of the time, and you need the guys up front to dominate. And so Quinn and Williams, uh, last year he wasn't healthy in the off season, so it kind of like pushed back. You know, by the time he was ready to go, the season was starting, and so he didn't really get into a groove. Like he was still good, but not like superstar good. Yeah. So he had a healthy off season this year. Came into the year the best shape of his life. And he's played at an Aaron Donald level. And, you know, next to him, you have Carl Lawson is healthy and playing like what they paid him to be. Uh, JFM, John Franklin Myers, has been really good when he's not getting bad penalties. Sheldon Rankins has kind of like flown under the radar, but he's yeah. been pretty solid. Um, you mentioned Bryce Huff. He plays like 10 snaps a game and always seems to pressure the QB. Like, they, they're just getting production from everybody up front. And so when you have the combo of that and the corners, that allows the coaches to get a little more creative and how they, you know, do the, use the safeties and the linebackers. Uh that's it. They've, they have struggled a little bit in terms of like when the linebackers and safeties have to cover like tight ends and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But um, I, I just think what they have up front and, and at corner, like the way Joe Douglas has built that defense personnel wise, that it just it's how it's supposed to be with like a San Francisco 49ers type defense. And this is what this is why they were able to flip it so quick because they made a lot of the right draft picks brought in. You know, they they made a concerted effort to bring in guys that like knew Robert Sala's system, like with some of these mm-hmm. veterans, you know, Quan Alexander. Solomon Thomas, DJ Reed played in San Francisco for a little bit. Um, so there's all these guys that had experience in it. And so that helps uh, just to like get everything going in the right direction. So, yeah, I mean, I would say linebacker and safety, like relative to the rest of the defense, you could argue are, are like weaknesses or maybe there's a lack of depth there. But I mean, the, the linebackers are solid, I would say. I mean, yeah. uh, you mentioned the guys and that the safety has been up and down, but they like Jordan Whitehead and LaMarcus Joyner and their leadership. Yeah, they've got a, it, it's honestly like a fun unit to watch and yeah. seeing how they play ball and just mixing up coverages on the back end and what they do up front with twists and stunts and games or sometimes just I mean what the there you got the rep against Green Bay where Quinn and Williams completely turns his man around, literally like lifts the guard's yeah. arm and just turns him and bashes him back into Aaron Rodgers. It's it's a violent, fast flowing group. And I love the point you mentioned too about uh, Bryce Huff, he's tied for fourth on this team in pressures, but is nowhere near like Quinn and Williams has 225 pass rush snaps. Lawson has 227. Uh, Franklin Myers has 185 and Bryce Huff has 77 and like significantly lower. And yeah, he's sitting crazy. there tied for four. Yeah, it's wild. And he, he had a really good game. 
against the Pats. Like you see yeah. that type of impact. And um, this is actually a really good question from the chat uh, related, related to this. Now um, the question for, uh, for you, Zach, you know, in terms of the, this Jets defense, what do you think makes them more dangerous? Do you think it's more of the front four and the front seven? Um, or do you think it's more tied just to that defensive line? I, I think it's more tied to the defensive line. I think they allow the linebackers more to like, do the things they do like they allow like Quincy Williams to come you know roaring off the edge and yeah. like, these huge hits on the run, running backs and stuff like that because they're there's clearing out space I mean Quinn and Williams it doesn't there's times I've I've seen clips you know of plays where like three guys are trying to block him he just like gets through them like it, it's he's playing at a level that I, I'm curious to see if he gets the attention at the end of the year uh, awards wise because you know you don't you hear Aaron Donald everybody just kind of like plugs in Aaron Donald is amazing and he's still amazing that's my point being like yes when it comes to the voting of these awards at the end of the year, winds up being like the names that you're used to. Oh yeah. The, the, the de facto, yeah. like, Oh, just tick the box. Like, yeah. Oh, so who's okay. TJ Watt. Okay. Aaron yeah, exactly. Donald, okay. Like if, if he keeps his, if he keeps his pace up, he's going to have like a defensive player of the year stat line. I don't know if he's, I don't think he'd win it. Um, but like the, he's playing at that level and yeah, that it, he's the key, like him up front. You need at least one guy dominating up front to open everything up in this defense, especially if you're only yes. rushing four. And he's doing that. So as long as he keeps us off, the defense should keep rolling. And he sees, like, to, to your point, he sees double teams. He sometimes sees, like, triple teams. And he's sitting there tied for eighth in the entire NFL in pressures, but first among all interior defensive yeah. linemen. And, like, a, a significant amount more than Aaron Donald at this point. Like, Quinn Williams is absolutely crushing it. You talked about some of the players they added and having that familiarity with Robert Sala and his scheme. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what does Sala bring to this defense? Who do they want to be defensively week in and week out in terms of scheme and structure? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I, you mentioned you mentioned the word violent earlier. Like, honestly, that's like what they say all the time. Like, that's the kind, that's the defense that they want to violent. They want to. That's when teams play them. They want to feel like they're playing a team that's violent. Yeah. And that's like the personality of all these guys they they brought in here. You look at Quan Alexander; every tackle he has is a big hit. Yeah. Um, Quincy Williams, same thing. Um, you know, CJ Mosley. I, I think his athleticism is kind of going away. But anyway, like they want a team that can dominate on the back end and dominate in the front. Like I said, and that so that allows them to do things in the middle of the field. Uh, you know, that maybe are a little more creative, or you know, they can you know get away with like, you know taking risks because you have. I mean not many teams can put two cornerbacks on an Island and that's yep. what the Jets do. They don't move them around because they trust both of them to cover their side of the field. So I, I think that, that the defense didn't work last year because they didn't have the corners and they didn't have the dominance up front and they have both of those things now. And, you know, it's funny. You, you mentioned like Bryce Huff, like that D line is so deep, but he, he was inactive the first three weeks. Fans were pissed off about that. Cause they, they, he's one of the, he's one of like, you know, got one of the guys that a fan base loves that maybe people outside of New York have never heard of, but they're like mm. obsessed with them. <laughs> um, yeah. And he wasn't playing the first three weeks. You know, they drafted Jermaine Johnson in the first round. They had to trade Jacob Martin just pretty much so they could like slot Jermaine in in that rotation at defensive end. Um, they have Michael Clemens, who doesn't get mentioned much, but they're really high in his potential. Like, it's uh, it really it really comes down to they just want to dominate up front and have the corners shut the receivers down on the outside, and then you know hope that everything works out in the middle of the field. You know, that rotation, it, it's so funny seeing what the Jets have up front because part of what has made the Buffalo Bills defense so successful this year is their ability to basically just run like hockey line style mm -hmm. changes up front. They basically have like two full rotations, two groups of four, and they can mix and match almost at any point. And it just keeps guys fresh and allows them to, especially when you want to play like how the Jets want to play like fast and violent, which is what the Bills are trying to do up front now as well you can play consistently fast and violent if you're fresh. Like it's so much easier to go a hundred miles an hour yeah. when you're only playing 45% of the snaps instead of having to play 65, 70, 75. So they don't rack up the snap counts and it really allows them to be more effective when they get in there. And yeah, they're getting contributions from the top level guys all the way down to seemingly anybody they rotate in. It's a real quality group and a quality unit. Last question for you. as we start to get you out of here, Zach, let's shift it back to the offense focus on the offensive line. A group you mentioned earlier that hasn't been great. And a lot of it has been due to injury, especially yeah. recently. Elijah Verrett Tucker was one of my favorite guys coming out of the draft last year. He goes down now with a triceps injury. It already started earlier in the year before the season started with Makai Becton going down. Now you see a group that is even more in a state of flux, which is even more, it's never good, but it's even less ideal when you've got a quarterback who is inconsistent and skittish at times in the pocket and outside Talk about this Jets offensive line. Where are they in terms of 
quality and level given the injuries that they've had and, you know, who they are coming into this game. Yeah. I mean, look, they, they started training camp with George Fant at left tackle and Makai Becton at right tackle. Makai Becton tears his knee. They signed Dwayne Brown. Yep. They moved George Fant to right tackle. Dwayne Brown hurts his shoulder. He goes on injured reserve. George Fant back to left tackle. You're starting a rookie, Max Mitchell. Um, Max Mitchell, George Fant's knee, which had been bothering him all summer, uh, is bad enough that they have to put him on IR. Max Mitchell hurts his knee in a game. He goes on IR. So they signed a guy off the, the Texans practice squad named Cedric Og. I, I need to learn how to say his last name, Ogbui. Uh, um, <laughs> just bringing anybody in that they can. It has to be like yeah, a warm body. He, he, started, he started this last game. It wasn't great. Um, you know, Nate, Nate Herbig's playing right guard now. He's been solid. Um, Lakin Tomlinson has kind of been a little bit of a disappointment considering what he was in San Francisco mm-hmm. and how much money they gave him. Yep. Um, yeah, Elijah Vera Tucker. I mean, that, you know, everybody focused on Brees Hall because he's the explosive guy, but Elijah Vera Tucker, I think, was their MVP up until the point he got hurt. Like, he he did something that had, had people marveling all across the NFL in, like, in and outside of it. Guy that started the season at right guard. He was a left guard last year, moved to left tackle, moved to right tackle, and it was all in short notice, and he was playing well at all the spots. And so it was really, really tough to see him go down, especially because it was like the, the Brees Hall injury was like more dramatic because you could see it was serious. Yeah. AVT all of a sudden was just like in the medical tent, and then he was out of the game. And nobody yeah. really saw it. So it's – uh yeah, so the offensive line has been shuffling guys in and out, which obviously with the offensive line you can't have. I think talent-wise, if everybody's healthy, they have a good group. Mm-hmm. Um, George Fan and Max Mitchell are still aren't going to play this week. One of them will – George Fant, when he's healthy, will be the right tackle. But, um, yeah, it's a concern because, like I mentioned, Zach Wilson does not do good when he's pressured. So this offensive line, if they don't play well against the Bills, they'll destroy them. Von Miller will be in Zach, Zach Wilson's face all day. Um, and I, it's a it's a major concern, and that's why you're going to see probably a lot of C.J. Uzama. He's a good blocker. You yeah. see him a lot out there. I think James Robinson's decent as a blocker for running back, so he might have to do that a lot. So it's uh, they have to get a lot of extra blockers, which obviously limits what you can do down the field too. So it's uh, it's going to be a real challenge on Sunday, that's for sure. Very fair. Zach, you've been tremendous. I got one more question before you go. If you're diagramming a potential path to victory for the New York Jets – this Sunday, what's the what's the core number one top level aspect you are focusing on? Like if the Jets can do this thing or maybe even a couple little things, what can they do in order to really kind of build a path to victory against the Buffalo Bills? I would say the number one aspect I would focus on would be luck. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it, um, like it realistically, I mean, you run down the clock as much as you can. You score first bring a lead if you can get a lead on the on the bills and just keep josh allen off the field like that's that's the way they go about it um zach wilson not turning the ball over would be like the number one key factor and if he can make some plays down the field but yeah i would no zach wilson turnovers get an early lead and they have a chance if the bills jump ahead then it's over well stated well said zach you've been getting a ton of positive comments in the chat throughout this entire episode um so you crushed it i really appreciate you taking the time joining me i love the hell out of your work Plug Thanks, it man. one more time. Yeah, of course. Um, plug it one more time. Everything you do, who you are, what you do, all that kind of stuff, just in case we got some people who trickled in later and didn't see it at the beginning. Plug your stuff, and uh, we can get you out of here. Yeah, and right. Cover the Jets for The Athletic. It's only $1 a month right now. If you don't subscribe, we have good Bills writers as well. Um, uh, I have a podcast called Can't Wait. We're on all the podcast platforms, YouTube. We're having our po- next episode on Friday. Uh, and I'm on Instagram at Zach Blatt NFL. Absolutely crushed it, man. I, again, I appreciate you taking the time and fitting me in and uh, go have fun with your dog and whatever else you want to do. I appreciate the hell out of you, and I'll see you around. Thanks, man. Good talking to you. Appreciate it. Later, Zach. Absolutely tremendous guest again here on the show. I feel like I say that every time a guest leaves, but uh, yeah, he was great as as I had hoped and anticipated that he would be. I love all, again, the positive comments. I love how kind everybody is to uh, – I saw the enemy, enemy territory comment. Appreciate you folks for welcoming Zach and appreciating his work. And also I see the comments from DF. Let's get some more likes. I know, I know it's corny to ask for them or to show for them or to focus on it and stop the show a little bit to mention it, but likes are the lifeblood to live streams. They go a long way towards helping this show and this brand to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. It legitimately affects the algorithm, bumps up the show and everything like that. So if you are enjoying this comment, a comment. If you're enjoying this show and this episode, please, 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 and thank you. Um, drop a like on this video um, and continue to encourage that in the chat. I appreciate you folks who do do that. This is fantastic here, this comment. Um, 
One, thank you very much for the super chat and for being here to the tree. And the tree says, I'll always be right behind you, Anthony. Go Bills. I appreciate you, uh, tree. Thank you very much. That's very well said. And also, in case anybody didn't notice, I'm going to drop the banner for a minute. We got a new tree, a November tree right now at this point. Wife changed the garland, got a little more fallish colors and some leaves attached to it. Left the jack-o'-lantern lights from October, but turned them a little bit so they're more pumpkins and less jack-o'-lantern-y. Um, also took the jack-o'-lantern tree topper off. Also changed some things. Got a little fall truck over there, a little pumpkin action over there. Um, so, yeah, we got a little more fall decor in the background for this episode. Shout out to my wife. Yeah, also, I do. I don't know if someone if the, if the tree profile was made for this tree. If it was and it's in relation to the show – I appreciate you 1000% forever. Like that warms my heart in ways I cannot possibly uh, describe. But again, major, major, major thanks uh, to Zach Blatt, who is, again, just a really quality writer for The Athletic and somebody who I was very excited to get um, on this show. Yeah, Mr. Zach Rosenblatt. I, I had him earmarked earlier in the year. and We were able to work it out and bring him on. Um, so again, major thank you to him and his insight into the New York Jets. And that's what we're going to continue to focus on here on this episode. So Zach gave us that insight. And he actually, you know, again, mentioned a lot of things that I had keyed in on. I've watched, you know, the Jets and Patriots tape, the Jets and Packers tape. And I forget what other game of the Jets, but I've watched three full Jets games, all 22 game tape, offense and defense, not just in preparation for this episode, partly because of who the other opponents they were playing and then doing some prep work and all these kind of stuff. I watch a ton uh, of game tape that isn't just Buffalo Bills related across the entire league. So it was cool to see a lot of the pieces that he brought in tie into several of the points that I have for Buffalo Bills versus New York Jets game deciding matchups. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go from number three to two to one here on this episode and give the top three most important game-deciding matchups for this game. As you know, like I like the viewers at home to play along. So what, what are you watching for? What are you looking for? Questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, anything and everything, throw it up into the chat. I love the engagement you folks have with each other and the engagement with me. And then as we get towards the back end, we will do stock up and stock down, which I want your input for as we do here um, on this show. I'm going to grab some of the comments here. DF Forever says, Ant, is that tree your second love? <sighs> I don't know how to rank my loves. Um, the wife is up there. Um, some family is up there. The Bills are up there. The Red Sox are up there. Um, Lionel Messi is up there. Um, there's a lot. I don't know how to rank them. The tree is definitely up there. The tree's in the Rolodex. Like, just like if I'm naming, like, my top five rappers of all time, like, it's hard, but there's a certain amount that are in the Rolodex and in the consideration. The tree is in the consideration. Like, the tree, my heart resides with the tree in a significant way. So, it's absolutely uh, pretty fantastic. Oh, I like the comment here. I like the hollow tree. Is this month's tree stuffed? No, just a regular tree. No stuffed tree in this aspect. But um, she knows. My heart belongs to the wife. Yeah, she's up there, though. She's definitely in the roll of the decks, like, but she's probably tops. Mm, probably. She's good. Bills, Jets, game-deciding matchups. Let's hit it. Actually, before we hit it, I have actually a pretty cool announcement that I want to do. You folks know the sponsorship for this show real quick. One Pie Pizza, the best pizza hands down in Buffalo, New York. The online menu can be found in the episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or any one of the podcasting apps or platforms you are listening to this show on. Again, if you're watching here on YouTube live or later, please drop a like on this video. If you are listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review wherever you are listening. Subscribe either way, podcasting apps, platforms, or on YouTube as well. Please, 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 and thank you. But a pretty cool announcement for our, from our folks at One Pie Pizza. Again, Tremendous pizza pie, tremendous people, the initiatives and drives that they do for the community, the homemade blue cheese, cup of char pepperoni, anything and everything. They are the best pizza hands down in Buffalo, New York. But what's also sweet is they came out with a new pizza and it's called the Cover One Allen Goat. Um, this guy's coverage, Allen Goat, right now. It is their homemade pizza dough topped with red sauce, goat cheese, chicken fingers, mozzarella cheese, red onion, and bacon. And when you order the Allen Goat, Mention disguise coverage, and you'll get three dollars off of your pie for the next two weeks as they launch this new pie. I am extremely excited because I've never had a food named after me. Um, had some pizza kind of, or some people potentially named after me, not because of me, just because I have a name that's Anthony, so it doesn't really count. But to have a product actually tied to this show and the relationship that I built with One Pie Pizza and to the brand. Um, there and then with cover one um i'm extremely excited so please 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 go get yourself the allen goat at one pie pizza again 
red sauce, goat cheese, chicken fingers, mozzarella cheese, red onion, and bacon. I'm getting one this weekend. They're going to be promoting it tomorrow. I'm going to be putting it out on the Twitter. I'm extremely excited for this pizza. One, because it sounds absolutely delicious and it looks delicious. Two, it's named after the show. And I'm extremely honored to have that type of relationship with One Pie Pizza. So extremely honored and excited. Keep, uh, keep a lookout on the socials for the pictures and the deliciousness. But if you live in the Buffalo area, which I know a lot of you do, go get yourself some One Pie Pizza and try the Allen Goat. And make sure you mention Disguise Coverage when you pick it up and get $3 off your pie. So thank you for allowing me to talk about that. And I see the comments coming in that says that sounds good. It does sound good. And I think it's going to be great. They don't make anything that's bad. Again, I say this all the time. I don't like potato salad. Cold stuff creeps me out. Their potato salad is fantastic. Like everything they make is gold. Um, not literally, but even if it was made of gold, it probably tastes delicious because they're fantastic. Go get yourself some one pie pizza. Now let's talk about some of the matchups here. Zach already alluded to some of it, um, especially in relation to Zach Wilson. My number three matchup for this game and game deciding matchup is the Buffalo Bills defense from a passing perspective, but the defense holistically versus Zach Wilson, somebody who has struggled a lot this year. The numbers I mentioned earlier of the 39 quarterbacks with at least 20% of dropbacks on the year, Zach Wilson is tied for last in completion percentage at 54.9%. He's 38th out of those 39 quarterbacks in rating when pressured. Also for, uh, for reference, Josh Allen is the fourth highest rated quarterback when pressured. Zach earlier also mentioned, not Zach Wilson, uh, Mr. Zach Rosenblatt. He also mentioned the lack of ability to stretch teams deep and go vertical. Only 10.6% of Zach Wilson's attempts this year have come 20 yards or more. And he's only completed four uh, completions. He's already made, he only made four completions out of those 10.6 attempts, which is about 15 attempts. So he's four for 15 going 20 yards or more. And I think the bigger thing, Zach earlier talked about it. It's I, I actually, I should have backtracked and not had a guest named Zach while also talking about Zach Wilson. Cause I feel like it's going to lead to confusion, but Zach, Mr. Zach Rosenblatt, he mentioned earlier seeing Zach Wilson in the pocket and seeing him out of the pocket and how he's struggling in both. And this was my biggest takeaway, especially in this new England game, but it's something that we've seen throughout the year, but this game more against new England last week, more was put on his shoulders. Brees Hall is out. You're trying to get James Robinson acclimated. Elijah Vera Tucker is out. Now Zach dove into all the injuries and the shuffling that this jets offensive line has had. The one constant has been Zach Wilson. He got some weirdness with Elijah Moore. Brees Hall goes down. The line is a mess things have been placed more onto the plate of Zach Wilson starting with this past week. And what you saw from Zach Wilson, again, this is a quarterback, good arm. He's got some zip. He's got a big arm and he's mobile. He's athletic. He's got good feet. He's, he's a legitimate threat with his legs, but he's struggling to create out of structure. He's bailing from the pocket early. And when he is bailing from the pocket, he's not finding success. He's getting caught. Like, do I run? Do I not? When he escapes the pocket receivers, again, to not to his credit, but kind of to put the picture together, receivers aren't getting separation downfield. So he's escaping the pocket. He's trying to find somebody and he can't, he had the one big completion to Garrett Wilson this past weekend, but when he leaves the pocket, you can see the indecision in his eyes and in his face. And it's tied to again, what Zach mentioned earlier and what I've noticed on tape the entire year, especially these last several weeks for Zach Wilson, he is predetermining, what he wants to do before the play happens. He's coming out and he's, okay, I'm going to Garrett Wilson on my, on this play. He's my number one read. That's who I'm going to. And if he has to get off that number one read, he struggles. You can almost see him tense up and freeze, not because he's, you know, going through his progressions, going from one to two to three, and he's reading the coverage and finding the windows and the passing lanes. He's freezing up. If you can change the pre to post snap picture on him, He's in a world, a world of hurt. If he thinks it's cover two and it is cover two, there's a chance he can beat you like any quarterback. And again, what I'm saying isn't unique to any quarterback or unique to Zach Wilson. Like, oh, if you can make them think A and you throw B at him, of course they're going to struggle. But better quarterbacks can think, okay, it's going to be cover two. And then when they drop back, they're like, oh, it's cover three. Okay, well, here's what my read is now based on the concepts. Boom, let me go here. Zach Wilson doesn't have that. He's not processing. You're not seeing that progression level passing and that progression reading coming from him, which if you're a Jets fan, is tremendously 
concerning, like his ability to not diagnose what's going on in front of him and being able to adapt and adjust in the moment. It's a big struggle. And then you tie it into some of the mechanical things you are seeing. He's inaccurate at times. He's missing high and he's sailing throws. Like it could be a little flat route. It could be a swing. It could be a 10 yard out. He's just way over the top and sailing some of his throws. He's got poor decision-making. Zach talked about it earlier in this episode. Like some of the interceptions that he threw were just, especially the one, I believe it's the second one, it's either the second or the third. He, he's about to run out of bounds and he just needs to chuck it out of bounds because there's nobody open. And he just kind of like lazily chucks it downfield and it gets intercepted on the sideline. Like there's, there's no excuse for it. And he immediately throws it and he puts his hands on his head and he's like distraught, but it's, it's just a bad decision. And you're seeing that consistently from him, not just in the turnover aspect. And he does have five interceptions on the year, which is a lot considering he missed the first several games due to injury, but whether it's mechanics, whether it's decision-making, whether it's, you know, reading the coverage and going through his progressions, he's struggling a lot from the head up right now. And it's causing his game to be hindered physically. Again, he's got a big arm and he's mobile, you're not seeing him being able to take advantage of either right now because of how much he's struggling with his mechanics and even more so the mental side of things. Like watch, watch this game and watch and see when he drops back to pass where his eyes immediately go. Cause they're going to go to his first read based on either what the design of the play is or based on what he's determining pre-snap, which isn't like rare. That's what quarterbacks do, right? If he can't get that first read, if he can't make that throw, it's a problem for him. And just watch. You'll watch, you'll see the hesitation or you'll see him immediately bail from the pocket or, or you'll see him tense and freeze up, which is even more of a problem considering the offensive line is having protection issues. So if you can take away his number one read, make him have to go through his progressions, and you pair that with a defensive front that has been getting after the quarterback this year for the Buffalo Bills, it kind of spells doom for Zach Wilson and this Jets offense. Take away his first read, make him have to go through his progressions. He's going to struggle. He's trying to predetermine his routes. And again, you've got a quarterback who's struggling with the mental side of things, going up against a Bills defense that, again, the name of the show is Disguise Coverage, in part because it's a huge philosophy I believe in, but also in part because of the Buffalo Bills defense ability to disguise coverage. They are in two high shells 73% of the time, which means two high safeties pre-snap. That's the third most in the league. What that does, as we've talked about, it allows them to spin safeties down and change coverages. They can show a too high look. And then, again, be show a too high look, and maybe it's cover two, maybe it's cover four, maybe it's cover six, maybe it's Tampa two, maybe it's lock and man on one side and zone on the other and rotating through different things, or – They'll spin a safety down and it's actually cover three or it's cover one robber or it's cover one lurk with a whole player rotating in different spots and coming from different players. The Bills defense does a tremendous job taxing quarterbacks mentally in addition to what they can do physically in terms of getting after quarterbacks, their run fits, anything and everything. But you take this Bills pass defense that is tremendous and a defense as a whole that is tremendous on this year. The Buffalo Bills defense coming into this game, their fourth in DVOA and they're fourth against the pass and fifth against the rush. They're a quality unit. We'll see what happens with Jordan Poyer. We'll see who the other starting safety is this week. Is it Jaquan Johnson? Is it Dean Marlowe? What does that position look like going forward based on Poyer's health and also based on Marlowe and Johnson? We'll see what happens, but just focusing on it in this game, 68% zone coverage for the Buffalo Bills defense. That's the second most in the entire NFL. 59% of their post snap coverages are in two high looks. That is the second most in the league. Um, 82% of the time, they're, they're rushing four. That's the third most in the league. We know what this Bills team is at this point. They don't have to blitz, and they're not blitzing because why? They get pressure with their front four because they can fit the run with light boxes and fit it with the front four, impact things. And when you're just rushing four, when you're rushing four 82% of the time, like the Buffalo Bills are, that means you're dropping seven into coverage 82% of the time. And that means – You've always got the numbers advantage. Forget about the quality of the players the Buffalo Bills have on defense, which is top-notch. They've got quality guys at every single level. But if you just think about the numbers, look at it from the offensive perspective. The offensive line, you have five offensive linemen, and you have a quarterback. That's six. Six taken away from 11 is five. That means at most an offense can send five out into the route distribution. If you're only rushing four and you're dropping seven, seven is greater than five. It's just simple math, let alone if – 
the offense feels threatened and can't protect with just five. Do they have to keep a tight end in? Cool, that's one less player in the route distribution. Do they have to keep a running back in? That's one less route player in the route distribution. There's all these things that stem from the Bills' ability to get pass rush with their front four and what they can do on the back end. And that's also tied into being able to disguise their coverages, right? Because they've got seven back there, they have more options on the menu. They can pick from more things to play because they've got more numbers. They can run almost anything back there based on what they do pre-snap, how they sit in their two high shells, and then having seven in coverage consistently. They can just rotate guys around, change coverages and scheme, and you see that a lot. There is no one coverage that the Bills are predominantly in. Ironically, it's the same for the New York Jets a little bit too. They will rotate coverages. It's you know, it's some man this game, it's some zone this game, it's two high man, it's two high zone, it's single high man, it's single high zone. The Chiefs game, like we talked about last week, was a perfect example of this. They threw almost every coverage that exists at Patrick Mahomes and that Chiefs Stevens, and they played them all well. And when they chose to throw them was even more impressive. So you're going to take that defense that can mentally tax a quarterback and throw it against a quarterback like Zach Wilson, who is struggling mentally. I think it's really an uphill battle. Um for Zach Wilson in this game. Also just looking at the Buffalo Bills pass defense, they're fourth in terms of EPA per attempt, and they have the third lowest quarterback rating against. So no matter how you slice it, if it's raw stats, if it's advanced metrics, when you look at the tape, this Bills defense is very strong top to bottom, but especially in pass coverage. And Zach Wilson is struggling a lot, and he's going to go up against a defense that can play a little bit of everything that will throw a little bit of everything at you. They're going to force him to get off his number one read. And this is a guy who wants to live in that world where he can predetermine things and just go to number one. And he's going to be put in a situation where he's got to go through his progressions. He's got to go through his reads. He's going to get pushed off platform. They're going to put the game into his hands and make him beat them. And at this point, what I'm seeing on tape, I don't think he's capable of it. So that's my third matchup because, again, if Zach Wilson can make some plays, right, if he can create some explosives either with his legs or with his arm, and he's got potential to do it. You know, Garrett Wilson is a good receiver. Denzel Mims, I know he's been... Muted myself, I'm so sorry. (laughs) There's some potential with these Jets weapons. There's been up and down play for Denzel Mims, but he's got some ability. Garrett Wilson, like Zach talked about earlier, is a stud. I wholeheartedly agree. He's my wide receiver one coming into this year. They do have some ability to threaten defenses. And you combine that with Zach Wilson's big arm and his legs, he can pull some plays and he can make some things happen. That's why it's the third matchup. If he can create some explosives and force this Bills defense's hand a little bit, get the crowd into this game, it's a potential matchup issue, but I think this Bills defense, this bowl constrictor defense, like Nate Tice said on this show, I think they squeeze everything for Zach Wilson. Throwing lanes, uh, potential escape and rush lanes for him. I think they condense this field, squeeze everything down, and make life tough for him. Um, and again, for a quarterback who's struggling to create out a structure, who is trying to predetermine his throws, going up against a defense that is tremendous against the pass with all those advanced metrics that we just spoke about, but in addition to the scheme and structure, they throw – at quarterbacks, it's going to be a lot um, for Zach Wilson in this game. Want to grab some of the comments? Go back a little bit. Um, oh, Heather says the tree is fun and cool, but what about thankful? Love it. Go Bills. Go Bills to you, Heather. Yeah, a little thankful. Uh, I am thankful. That usually stays up all year round, but we started rotating a bit and then put it back up for Thanksgiving. So I appreciate you. Um, ba ba ba. DF Forever says, I think we lock in our wide receivers wide this game and run up the gut. You could potentially see it. We're going to talk about that uh, potential matchup in relation next um, as we start to go through the rest of these matchups here. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Roy. Roy says, damn, I thought I went deaf for a moment. No, that was me. I muted myself. Um, I don't even know how I clicked it. I I guess that's just on me. I, I apologize greatly. Um, I love seeing, again, all the comments, questions, thoughts, everything. Um coming through. So please continue to throw them in. I get to everything as I go through my notes. I try to make it to every, any and every single comment within reason, within time. Again, super chats always get priority because the color attracts my eyes. Um, it takes me away from my notes and also because I respect the monetary donation. Um, Oh, mind over mana comes in and says, I'm usually worried about any game, but I'm not worried about this one. If we both arguably have good defenses, then Buffalo has a superior offense should be pretty straightforward. I think that's fair. I think it's a fair estimation and not just from like a, again, I am anything 
but a homer. Um, I'm tremendously objective, especially with how I study this game league wide. Like I don't just watch Bill's tape. I watch Bill's tape across the entire NFL um, and kind of treat everything on an equal plane. The Bills have the advantage. The Bills are the much better football team, but there is a path to victory for um, for this New York Jets team. And it starts with that number three matchup. If Zach Wilson can pull off some explosives and seeing what he can do with his arm and his legs, that's a potential piece. Um, but the other, the, the, the bigger pieces come on the other side of the ball in that matchup. And so the number two matchup for me is this Jets pass defense against the Buffalo Bills offense. I want to start with it from a scheme and structure perspective. Zach talked about it a little bit in terms of who they want to be philosophically fast and violent. And they are, it starts with the front in terms of how they rush the passer. I think they really got put on the map a little bit with what they did to Aaron Rodgers and the Packers in Green Bay, who, you know, at this point, maybe that doesn't really mean anything to you. And maybe you're taking that with a grain of salt because you don't think the Packers are a good football team. But this front, again, the number I mentioned earlier for Quinn and Williams, they're led by Quinn and Williams. Um, Eighth most pressures in the entire NFL and the most for any interior defensive lineman, he's consistently pushing the pocket. He's winning one-on-one matchups. He is, he's getting pushed. He's getting pop. He's got strong get off. He's operating with technique. He's got power. And then you're mixing him in with everything else that you're seeing for this Jets team. Carl Lawson for them last year, coming over from Cincinnati, I thought was one of the best signings of the off season last year. He wrecks his Achilles, misses the whole year. He's looking good this year. He's second on this team in pressures with 24, and you're starting to see him round into form a little bit. He's getting pressure off the edge. He's working on some stunts and looping. He can be a spiker. He's starting to come into form. Zach mentioned John Franklin Myers, who's giving them real quality reps. He can bump down inside and reduce. He can kick out to the outside and work your offensive tackles. He had a, he had a rep against the Pats where he takes their right tackle and literally drives him back into Mac Jones right into his lap. We talked about Bryce Huff earlier Dude is fourth on this team, tied for fourth on this team in pressures, and has only seen 77% of the pass rush snaps. And like Zach mentioned earlier, he was he wasn't even active for the first three games. Then you have Sheldon Rankins, you got Michael Clemens. They've got a strong defensive line. They can get after the quarterback. And again, like Zach mentioned, they don't blitz a lot. This is a team that, you know, so the Bills, they usually rush for. They like to live in that world. They uh they they want they want Von Miller and that crew just to sit and do their thing. The Bills defense, like I mentioned earlier, 82% four-man rush rate. That was the third most in the entire NFL. If you're looking at the Jets defense, they're only one percentage point less. They have an 81% four-man rush rate. That's fourth. Again, one percentage point lower than the Bills and one spot lower. They rely on this front four to get pressure, which oh, we gotta stop because we got a super chat. Thank you very much for the donation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for again the donation and the comment and everything. I really appreciate that. The comment here says Greg Rousseau and Ed Oliver against Herbig and Remmers, Gabe Davis versus DJ Reed, go Bills. Yeah, the comment here highlights some of those schematic mismatches. And again, this Jets offensive line is banged up. They didn't have a ton of depth coming into the year. And then even their depth guys got hurt after their starters got hurt. And the Bills defensive line is clicking. Ed Oliver, I don't know if he had an underrated game against the Packers. I think people are down on the Bills defense a bit because of how the Packers were able to run on the Bills. But Ed Oliver had a game, violent, uh, causing chaos, causing havoc, problem inside, as has Daquan Jones has been a monster all year. Tim Settles giving you quality reps. So has Jordan Phillips. I think the Bills have a significant advantage on the interior um, against what the, what, what the jets are throwing up front. And then, yeah, especially on the edge, Dwayne Brown is still good. Although he's older, he's had some injury issues and you're throwing Greg Rousseau and Von Miller against him. Um, and then, but a, a matchup I am excited to see, and we're going to continue to talk about it. I like how you mentioned it here. So Gabe Davis versus DJ Reed, you know, who covers Gabe Davis, who covers Stefan Diggs? Any way you slice it, DJ Reed is having a good year. So is sauce Gardner. This past defense as a whole, and again, thank you very much for the super chat. Thank you very much for being here um, and for the comment and everything. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, but that leads perfectly into this point, like this second matchup here of the Jets pass defense against the Buffalo Bills offense. You've got this pass defense that is so strong for the Jets. You talk about what the Bills do, and they, throw, they play a little bit of everything in terms of coverage on the back end. So do the Jets. 61% zone, 21% man, 44% of the time in two high coverages, 38% of the time in single high coverages. They mix up what they do. They mix up man and zone. They mix up single high and two high. 
They like to, they like to stay in nickel. They are primarily a nickel defense with five DBs on the field, 59% of the time, but then their second highest personnel grouping on defense is a traditional base package of four, three, four that they're in 29% of the time. And then what's even crazier, 32% of the time they have a stacked box, which is the most in the entire NFL. But you look at their performance again, from a pass perspective, this is a defense that is eighth overall in DVOA eighth against the pass, eighth, eighth against the run. But when you break down their specifics and how they function against specific aspects of an offense, they're sixth in DVOA against wide receiver ones. They're ninth in DVOA against wide receiver twos. They're eighth in DVOA against tight ends. They're ninth in DVOA versus running backs. Again, this is all in the pass game. They're sixth in lowest EPA per attempt in pass defense. And they have the fourth lowest quarterback rating against for their pass defense. This is a quality unit saw headed and led by sauce Gardner and DJ Reed, two tremendous acquisitions like Zach black talked about earlier in this episode, sauce Gardner, arguably the, the corner one coming out of this draft length, size, speed, willingness to tackle physicality can play a variety of techniques on the back end can function in a variety of coverages. Good dude, good head on his shoulders. DJ Reed fast, aggressive, good zone corner, can play some man. He's emboldened by being with Robert Sala and then being that number two corner, giving you quality reps. And again, they're very balanced in what they do. This isn't a team that's like, well, primarily they're a cover two team or primarily they're this. They play a little everything. They do have the second most cover four snaps in the entire NFL, but that doesn't dominate their snap share on defense. They will throw a little bit of everything at you, similar to what the Bills do. And again, that makes sense. Like Robert Sala was one of those guys at the forefront of strong defenses built to succeed in today's NFL. So he's going to rely on his front four to rush the passer. He's going to drop seven into coverage. He's going to try and change the pre to post snap picture. And he's going to rotate bodies all while trying to play fast and violent and aggressive and flow to the football. This is a good unit. And talked about DJ Reed being good with that segue from the super chat that came in earlier. So I'm talking about sauce, sauce Gardner a little bit, just for some numbers to kind of put it into perspective of the cornerbacks with at least 20% of snaps. He has the fifth lowest reception percentage allowed on the year. He has the eighth lowest rating when targeted, and he's got 10 pass breakups on the year, which is the most amongst all amongst those corners uh, with at least 20% of reps. He's having a phenomenal rookie year. And again, then you see those numbers when you put on the tape, his ability to stay in phase, his ability to work in press, his ability to work in off. You're watching him run routes for receivers. He's reading the route distribution. Well, he's reading patterns. He's reading technique. His technique is so sound. And you add that with his length and his size and his frame, he's a problem out there at corner. And from a, from a pure football fan standpoint, this is an awesome matchup because Buffalo is coming into this game riding hot with Josh Allen and this passing offense. You've got Stephon Diggs, you've got Gabe Davis, and then you've got these two strong corners in DJ Reed and Sauce Gardner. And it's, it's just really good to see how they're functioning and how they're working and what they're doing. And, Man, I oh, I gotta stop. We got super chat. Jason says, "What are you seeing?" I'm, I'm guessing you mean Quinn and Williams. Leonard Williams is gone from the Jets and now on the Giants. But Jason says, "What are you seeing with Williams that has taken him to the next level this year? He is the real threat, in my opinion. We know how great interior D line players can cause us problems." And then he says, "Parentheses, anyone really?" That's a piece that Jason. I'm going to keep this in my back pocket. For the, for, for the number one matchup that we're going to talk about because that's tied into my number one matchup, and I'm going to deep dive into that in a minute. I love where your head is at. One, I appreciate you being here as always. Two, thank you very much for the super chat. That's tremendous, the 10 bucks. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you sincerely. Um, but I'm going to get to this. I'm back pocketing this. I will bring it back up again when we get to the number one matchup in a little bit because this is heavily tied to my number one matchup. Oh, and then Jason says, oops, sorry, you got it wrong, Williams. Oh, okay, okay, keep your secrets, but I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, this Jets pass defense, they'll throw a lot at you in terms of coverage, mixing it up between man and zone, too high single, what they're locking, what they're not, playing combo coverages, and it's led by and able to exist because of Sauce Gardner and because of DJ Reed, their quality group. And you factor in what the Bills have done on offense this year, which is really – even including the Miami game, which is an outlier because of the heat and the injuries and all the wonkiness and weirdness that happened in that game. But Ken Dorsey has done a pretty good job this year in terms of 
getting his guys into favorable matchups, whether it's alignment or personnel groupings or both dictating to the defense and putting them into predictable and or dictated to positions where Dorsey can get those favorable matchups. And one of them has been Stefan Diggs in the slot this year, Stefan Diggs in the slot this year, 38.1% of the time that is up from 20.9% last year and even up more than what it was in 2020 when he was in the slot 31.5% of the time. What Ken Dorsey has been able to do by putting Stefan Diggs in the slot and mixing that in with personnel groupings, like going with two tight ends or two, two running backs, well, two running backs, meaning like Reggie Gilliam and Singletary or Gilliam and cook. And then putting them, you know, having, having going in 12 personnel and running a three by one formation or still going spread. And then having Stefan Diggs be that guy in the slot. He's got Stefan Diggs matched up on linebackers on safeties on nickel corners at times. And Stefan Diggs has been eating on the interior using him in the slot has been a good move and good play so far this year. And this is a bills team. 73% of the time this year, they've been in 11 personnel, meaning three wide receivers, their next highest personnel grouping is 21 personnel, which they've been 18% of the time that speaks to the Reggie Gilliam usage and what they're starting to do. 15% RPOs. We know how much Josh Allen loves his RPOs and Ken Dorsey does as well. 15% RPO usage rate fifth most in the league. This is a passing offense that is clicking. Again, this is a good offense as a whole. Bill's offense is fourth in DVOA, second in the pass, 25th in the rush. Josh Allen can beat you at any point in time. I don't want to gush too much about the individual piece of Josh Allen and these weapons, but that is part of the fun matchup. You've got good dudes on the back end for the Jets. You've got really good dudes on the back end for the Jets and for the Buffalo Bills as well. So the individual matchups are going to be fun, let alone the scheme and structure and how the Bills have been able to diagram things in their favor, whether it's with pre-snap motion, whether it's with personnel alignments, whatever have you, they've been able to dictate to defenses a lot this year. The Jets have been able to do the same thing with their versatility, their aggressiveness, their scheme and structure. It's going to be a very good matchup seeing this Jets pass defense against this Bills passing um, offense. And another example I wanted to bring up, or not example, but piece I wanted to hit on, uh, Charles said this earlier. It was like, Charles, it was like you read my brain. Charles said, red zone offense is key. The Bills can move the rock versus anyone. Last year we had that field goal fest of a game versus the Jets. Can't have that happen again. If you're looking at the Buffalo Bills offense, which we are right now, they're 24th in red zone DVOA on the year. So not great. 13th in the pass, 32nd running the ball in the red zone in terms of DVOA. But again, on that flip side, you take a look at the Jets defense, they're 30th in red zone DVOA, 28th against the pass, 28th against the rush. They have not been good in the red zone. The Bills offense has been better in the red zone than the Jets defense has, but both of them have not been ideal and have not been great. And that's another mini matchup within this larger matchup in this larger scheme, seeing that functionality in the red zone um, in terms of who they can be and what they can do. And if you want to look on the flip side, Bill's defense uh, fourth in DVOA in the red zone, fourth against the pass, eighth against the rush. Jets offense, 19th DVOA in the red zone, 21st against the pass, 14th against the rush. And it's gotten a little worse um, with the loss of Brees Hall and the struggles of Zach Wilson recently. So, that's a fair, uh, fair piece from Charles and, and a note that I wanted to hit on. Cause again, I think that ties into obviously the things for both sides. Um, but I figured I'd mention it now since Charles brought in that aspect. So the third most important matchup, how do the bills continue to keep the foot on the throat of Zach Wilson, continue to hinder him in terms of his progressions and his reads and the mental side of his game that is causing obstacles and challenges for him physically and limiting his upside as a quarterback right now, matchup two. This Jets pass defense against the Bills offense, a pass defense that is genuinely good. It's a defense that for the Jets is good as a whole. It's also just, again, fun as a football fan. Like there's good individual matchup. There's good scheme and structure. And you're really going to find out like how good is this Jets defense? Because they're going to go up against the top offense. And for this Bills defense, or Bills offense, I'm, I'm sorry, you're facing another quality group. How do you function? Are you able to dictate against a group that is playing well? is executing well and has a boatload of confidence coming into this game. That's going to be an exciting piece to look at 
for the number two matchup. The number one matchup that we're going to go, oh, question here from Jessica. Jessica says, Ant, do you think we will see more split back? I'm very interested to see if we will. I am extremely intrigued. I like Naheem Hines. I like him a lot. Um, and this is before he was a Buffalo Bill. Um, I've had him in fantasy for three out of his first four or five years in the league, um, including that uh, 2020 year um, when he had like over 60 receptions along with his rookie year. So I, his skill set in game is one that I truly enjoy. I'm very interested to see how the running back snaps and usage shakes out now with the addition of him into this offense. Whose role is he eating into? Is it Isaiah McKenzie's? Is it James Cook? Is it Devin Singletary? We just saw a good running performance from Devin Singletary and James Cook. We saw a good passing performance from James Cook. His uh, in the third or fourth quarter, you know, when they spread out and they go five wide and James Cook is in the slot and he runs that slant and it's not there and he sees Josh has to escape the pocket and he turns that slant into an over and looks and realizes the defense is in cover three and realizes where the open space is and he gets behind the second level of that defense and he gets even with Josh Allen so Josh can drop in that teardrop and Cook can make that catch and get up field. James Cook had a really strong game. What does that usage look like at that position with the addition of Naheem Hines? I do think you will see James Cook and Naheem Hines in there together, mainly because I think that's such a headache for defenses. What do you do? Because the run is a legitimate possibility. You could motion out of split back in the backfield and put both of them in the slot or one of them out wide or both of them out wide. You could reload the formation in a variety of multitude of possibilities. You could leave Cook in the backfield and motion Hines out and then run a jet sweep or fake that or run orbit motion or motion Allen out and run wildcat with Naheem Hines. And you could do some of that with Singletary as well. I do think you will see more two running back sets with the addition of Naheem Hines. I think Naheem Hines was added not just as a running back, just as a weapon. Um, so I do think you can see uh, more split back. Joe says, I'm just jumping in. How's his pass pro? Not a strength, but not a deficiency or a vulnerability, I should say. Um, he's adequate, adequate to sufficient. And I don't mean that like negatively. There's not a lot of good pass protecting running backs nowadays. Um, and considering the upside he presents in his receiving game and his speed and his burst and the nuance that he has in his route running, I think his pass protecting is fine. Again, I'm not putting him up there in like top 10 pass protecting running backs in the NFL, but he's not a vulnerability. I'm not sitting back there closing my eyes and crossing my fingers that he's going to be able to hold up. So he's adequate to sufficient, not a strength, but definitely not a vulnerability. Um, I like that uh, triple reverse. Yeah. Wing T triple option, whatever, throw anything at him. Oh, so we've talked about some of our matchups so far. And again, the number one and number two were tough for me because I enjoy the chess match aspect of football in general, but especially this game, because I really like what the Jets defense has done, stunning them on film, stunning them on game tape and game tape and seeing again, how they do a little bit of everything. And it's not like they do a little bit of everything just so they can do it. They do a little bit of everything because they're good at almost everything and they can live in that world. They're not hindered or handicapped or handcuffed um, by personnel or by you know having to live in certain coverages they don't really get dictated to it's a good group and that's same thing can be said for the buffalo bills offense but let's talk about the number one matchup and i'm a man of my word much like the joker in the dark night so i wanted to go back and bring up jason's comment jason says again what are you seeing with quinn and williams that has taken him to the next level this year. He's the real threat, in my opinion. We know how great interior defensive line players can cause the Bills problems, parentheses, anyone, really. That is tied into my number one matchup for this game, which is the Jets' D-line versus the Buffalo Bills' offensive line. We'll start with Quinn and Williams because Jason uh, put the money up for it, so I appreciate you, Jason. As I mentioned earlier, Quinn and Williams, eighth in the entire NFL for all positions in terms of pressures, tied for eighth in total pressures, but he's first among all interior defensive linemen. He gets double teamed a whole bunch. Doesn't matter. Stay strong at the point of attack or splits the double team and makes a play. If you block him one-on-one, -on -one, he can beat you with a strong get-off. He can beat you with hand technique. He can beat you with pass rush moves. He can split offensive linemen. He can beat you and, you know, slant short side or backside. He's having a tremendous year. And, you know, Zach Blatt, my guest earlier from The Athletic, he hit on it by saying Quinn Williams was banged up last year. and You didn't really get to see him 
perform to the level he's capable of. This year he was healthy this offseason, healthy coming into this year, and now you've got a guy who's cranking and running on all cylinders. And what's taken him to the next level, I think, is simple as, you know, I don't think it's a cop-out. Like, he's healthy. He's not hindered by an injury that's causing him to play at less than not even everybody has to play at less than hundred percent. It's football, but he was playing at like 60, 70% last year. And you're seeing him really being able to unleash everything he has in his arsenal. And from an execution standpoint, what's taken him to the next level is his ability to do everything. He's stout against the run. He can provide pass rush pressure. He's he doesn't get washed out easily. He's strong at the point of attack. He's got good hands usage. He's got pop. He's got a quick get off. He's a big, strong dude who's quick and athletic and has a high football IQ and has some technique to mix with all of that. And he's a problem. He's the focal point of this matchup between the Jets defensive line and the Bills offensive line, because like Jason says, like great interior defensive players can cause the Bills problems. And sometimes just players in general, this is an offensive line that has been up and down. They've been better the last several weeks. They've been better in pass protection than they have been run blocking. But this is a unit that holistically has been up and down. They have been leaky at times in their pass protection. They've been inconsistent. Josh Allen is really the best deterrent for any type of sacks or pressure. It's not the offensive line. It's Josh being an eraser, whether he IDs the blitz and IDs the pressure and can either evade it or get to his read vertically like we saw against the Kansas City Chiefs or underneath at times with the hot routes or it's him yeah just using his physical ability and evading a rusher and getting outside the pocket Josh is the best deterrent for pressure and sacks at this point which isn't necessarily a negative against the offensive line because Josh Allen's a tremendous athlete and tremendous player but the offensive line is an inconsistent and up and down in their pass protection thus far this year which again I still think makes sense with how with they've been injured they've been banged up they haven't had a lot of time to gel you've had different combinations and people in the lineup plus there's some injuries up there as well even for the dudes that are still playing josh allen has been the eraser for this offensive line and pass protection and also so is the scheme a little bit they've run a lot of quick game this year um josh allen has a 67 percent short drop back rate which is the fifth most in the nfl um so seeing how this bill's offensive line performs in the past against a unit that Again, they're nasty, they're angry, they're mean, they're violent, they're skilled, they're deployed well, and they have a good rotation on that Jets defensive line. Again, I don't think it's the level that the Buffalo Bills defensive line is in terms of how they can just rotate body after body, but it's up there. Again, Quinn and Williams, Carl Lawson, John Franklin Myers, Bryce Huff, Sheldon Rankin, Michael Clemens, um, even Jermaine Johnson is seeing what he's doing. Solomon Thomas is giving you quality reps and points this year. Vinny Curry, like, and then you add what they do from the second level which again, isn't part of the defensive line, but how they've kept Quincy Williams and Quan Alexander and CJ Mosley clean to make plays. This is a group up front for the Jets, their defensive line that is built very similar to the Bills. They got pop, they got violence, they got athleticism, they got speed. They can collapse the pocket or they can penetrate and create problems. This is a good group, a good, 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 good group up front. They run games, they run stunts, Simple things, just little twists and stunts. Sometimes a big one. Sometimes they'll slant their right edge and their three tech on the right side, and then they'll loop the backside, one of the backside defenders, the backside edge, the backside defensive tackle. Like they play long games, they play short, and they execute. They're ninth as a unit in pass rush win rate. They are seventh as a unit in run stop win rate. And again, 81% four man rush rate, which is the fourth highest in the league. They're getting pressure with four. They're fitting the run with four. That's the other piece I want to talk about as well, right? How does this run game function? We've seen this Buffalo Bills offense start to find more success on the ground over these last several weeks. It started towards the back end of the Steelers game. It's It continued against Kansas City, and it continued this past Sunday against the Green Bay Packers. On the year, this Buffalo Bills offense 61% zone runs, 34% gap runs. What we've seen these last several weeks is more is, is a swinging is a swinging of that pendulum more towards the gap side of things. 42% gap rate versus the Green Bay Packers, 50% gap rate versus the Kansas City Chiefs. Again, their usage rate on the year was 34%. So those last several weeks have put the numbers up a little bit. They were even lower 
before. So think of what the Bills were in terms of more of a zone running team. The majority of the early part of this year, they started to shift. We're seeing more pin and pulls. We're seeing more power. We're seeing more counter. We're starting to see those runs that the Bills used last year when they started to have success in the run game down the stretch. And it's paying dividends to this game and for the Buffalo Bills having a pivot to Josh Allen in the pass game. And now you take them starting to find their rhythm and starting to find their footing and you put them up against a defense that has a front four that wins almost week in and week out, whether again, ninth as a unit in pass rush win rate, seventh as the unit in run stop win rate led by Quinn and Williams. They have a good rotation. All these things are violent. They're fast. They're athletic. They got technique, all the things I'm saying, who controls the trenches on that side of the ball? Cause the one thing other than injuries, knock on wood, that can stop Josh Allen or hinder Josh Allen is inconsistent offensive line play and pressure from the defensive line. And if the Jets can get it with four, if they can get Josh off his spot, or worse to a degree, if they can condense and compress the pocket and not give him lanes to escape and then use their good coverage on the back end, because they're able to drop seven like the Bills, because they're able to rotate coverages on the back end, like the Bills, because they can play a little bit of everything on the back end, like the Bills, and because they're a good defense with talent and good coaching, like the Bills, this could be a very interesting matchup for the Buffalo Bills offense. I don't think this is like a true test. I don't want to completely say that, but I do believe in this Jets defense. And even if the Bills shred them, I think it's more of a feather in the cap of the Buffalo Bills offense than it is saying this Jets defense isn't real. This Jets defense is real. You look at the advanced metrics, but more importantly, you look at the tape, how they're able to stifle offenses and create problems. They're still having some growing pains. They're still young back there. They're still finding their footing in some aspects. And the linebackers can be beaten in coverage. Quincy Williams wants to be a missile and come forward majority of the time. Um, C.J. Mosley isn't completely what he used to be, but he's still a good linebacker, um, as is Quan Alexander, but none of them are standout all pro. The safeties, like uh, like Zach mentioned earlier, you got the Marcus Joyner, you got Whitehead. They're fine. They'll make some plays, but they're not holistically like a strong part of this team, so they will be susceptible a little bit on the back end, but it helps that they've got two really good corners with Sauce Gardner um, and DJ Reed. But seeing what this front does, that's where it all starts. If the Jets can get pressure with four and cause problems for Allen, if they can cause problems in the Bills' run game, if the Bills can't run the ball and force the Jets to bring a safety up or bring another defender in the box, right, that means the Jets can live in too high. That means the Jets can have a coverage number or a coverage advantage because they have more numbers back there. It's simple math. If the Bills can't affect this Jets defense by running the ball and protecting Josh Allen, it skews that pendulum towards favoring the New York Jets. And this is another good test for the offense to a degree, but more so for the Bills offensive line, continuing to see, okay, the Chiefs defense hasn't been great against the run. The Packers defense hasn't been great against the run. You ran it at the end of the game against the Steelers when, I don't want to say the game was out of hand, but game script became an issue. This Jets defense is coming for blood. They definitely want the win. They believe in themselves. They're feisty. They're chippy. They're young. They don't know any better. They make plays. Can you run against a legitimately good front coached well with good scheme and good structure and good execution and good players? That's a huge piece too. Like as the bills continue to find themselves in the run game, now they're facing a genuinely good run defense. How do they run against that? How do they hold up in terms of pass protection? I will feel much better against Dob says, geez, Ant, you sound scared. No, I just, I just appreciate good football. And the Jets are playing good football. This is a team that you got to see what Zach Wilson's going to be for the future. But I like the hiring of Robert Sala. I was a fan of his in San Francisco. And I thought that was a good hiring for the Jets. And they had a really good draft class this year. They brought in some good free agents, not just from a talent perspective, but talent combined with scheme fit. And as much as I am a Bills fan, which I clearly am, um, I, I really just, I like good football and I respect um, good football. And there's a lot to like when you look at the Jets and you watch them play. Um, and so as a football fan, like this is a cool game and and it's fun. I, I think the Bills had the advantage in a multitude of areas. And I do think this is a game that heavily favors the Bills. Um, but yeah, I, I, if, they can, if they can execute that chess match piece, whew, 
yeah, we'll see what can happen. Um, and again, it's going to start up front. If the Bills can't pass protect, if the Bills can't uh, succeed in the run, more gets put onto the plate of Josh Allen. He gets taxed more mentally and physically, and then we're at a point where the playbook, you open it up, it's just a picture of Josh Allen, and he has to be Batman on every play. Um, and the offensive line is a position group that I was concerned about in this offseason. I've been concerned about it through the regular season. I'm still concerned about it now to a degree. Um, and this is a good Jets group up front, so I want to see – um, like Jason mentioned earlier with the super chat, how do they handle Quinn and Williams? Do they have to double him? What does Saffold look like one-on-one against Williams? How does Morse fare? How does Ryan Bates fare? How do they handle Franklin Myers and Carl Lawson and all these guys who can beat you around the edge with speed around the arc? They can go through you. And then the stunts in the games, their communication will be tested. Their individual execution will be tested. I'm excited um, for this matchup. Um, but between the Bills and Jets in general, but especially up front in the trenches, you got a good group in the Jets and a group that's been a little bit of a question mark for the Buffalo Bills at time this year. Potentially another game with David Questenberry. I thought he looked good in the run game against the Green Bay Packers, um, but we know what he is limited in terms of his athleticism. How does he fare against the smaller, bendy, more bursty, explosive guys like Carl Lawson? Is that a matchup they can exploit? A lot of chess match potential. Um for for this game and so again number three matchup the bills defense against zach wilson keeping the foot on his throat and continuing to make him struggle like he has last week in the previous couple weeks matchup number two the jets pass defense gets the buffalo bills offense and then the number one matchup the jets defensive line versus the bills offensive line very excited um i'm going to be diving into more tape as the week goes forward in terms of clipping it not just using it for prep um for all the shows that i do but also putting it out and putting it on Twitter. So again, follow me on Twitter at pro underscore underscore ant. That's pro two underscores A N T. But I'm putting out some clips of uh, what the Jets do well on both sides of the ball, and then also where their vulnerabilities are. So you can see it start to get a little bit of that preview um, before Sunday happens. And oh, and Jason says here too. This is the time of year where narratives get reinforced or they start to bust. The Jets having a great defense, the result of the schedule or valid. This is a huge game for the Jets to test, to test their metal. I agree with you to a degree, although DVOA eliminates and reduces some of those variables like schedule and quarterback play and that by putting everything on an efficiency scale and an efficiency metric. And with the Jets being eighth overall and versus the run and the pass, considering how poorly they started, I do think they have a good defense. But exactly to your point, how they fare in this game. Like, do they lose to the Bills and they give up 24? Or do they lose to the Bills and they give up like 40 plus? And it's like... Not that, not there, and kind of like pat him on the head or do yet. Yeah, I think test their metal is a very strong way to put it. Uh, not strong in a bad way, like strong in a good way. Um, I think that's solid. Oh, Carl Thomas comes in and says, Is Greg Rousseau versus Mike Remmers the best matchup? Honestly, I this is gonna sound rude. <laughs> I don't know what the best matchup is because I, I don't think there's a bad matchup for the Bills defensive line against the Jets offensive line. This is a group that's banged up. I honestly would say probably anybody that is not matched up against Dwayne Brown. He's their best offensive lineman at this point. Um, Like Zach mentioned earlier, Lakin Tomlinson signed for big money along with some decently big expectations coming into this year. He has not played good at guard. So Brown is their best offensive lineman to me. Tomlinson is probably their second best, but neither of them really strike fear into me. Yeah, I'd probably say attacking Remmers um, or attacking Herbig. That right side in general, whether it's Nate Herbig or whether it's Mike Remmers, um, I think that right side is a vulnerability. So whether you want to compress it with Greg Rousseau, whether you want to test it with Von Miller, um, I think that right side of the Jets line, and even honestly extending into the center a little bit with Connor McGovern, who's not terrible, um, but isn't a stalwart, um, I think you can even extend that right side vulnerability into the center. So from you know the center over, but I think, yeah, it really starts on that right side. I think it could be a toss up between Remmers um, and her big um, given what they've, how they've shown this year and how the bills have performed. Good question. Very good question. And now let's start to shift the focus a little bit as we wind down here on the show, not completely, but Buffalo bills stock up, stock down. This is the part where I really like to get a lot of the fan engagement, which we've had through this entire show already, to be honest, but who or what is trending up for you in this game? Who, why, what, why, good or bad? Again, up or down, stock up, stock down. Who are you selling on? Who are you buying? Who are you sending to the moon in a good way? Who are you jettisoning into the sun 
in a bad way, um, let me know in the chat. I'll bring up a lot as I start to work through several of mine um, at this point. I'm going to start with my first stock up, and it's ironic that it's no, well, not ironic, but you know, the Bills traded for Naheem Hines. My number one stock up coming out of the Bills game was James Cook. We saw him really start to flash what we saw in in college at Georgia on the tape. The vision, the footwork, the elusiveness. He he had the one I broke it. I I, I broke it down on Twitter and then also in the in the film room last night with Kendall. There's that that pin and pull run where Preston Smith comes off the edge, Dawson Knox feigns the block, Smith comes off too aggressive, almost falls down, Roger Saffold meets him, but it's in the backfield, and Cook is going that way, and Cook smoothly, confidently, calmly, athletically, whatever verbiage you want to use to explain it, just a quick little jump cut. You watch his, both of his feet pick up and then land and then go. Then he breaks a tackle at the second level, gets the first down. Quay Walker tackles him out of bounds, gets uh, into a disagreement with one of the Bills guys on the sideline, pushes him, gets ejected. It's that play. You see the reception that I talked about earlier in this game where he's lined up in the slot and he runs a slant and see that it sees that it's not there and Josh has to escape and he just looks for open space. Finds it behind the second level of the defense running cover three. Finds the green grass. Keeps working. Turns a slant into a deep over. Josh drops it in the bucket with a little teardrop. James Cook catches it over the shoulder. Gets up field. Big play. We saw successful runs. We saw him break some tackles. We saw him change angles with his speed and his burst. I am excited to see what the future holds for James Cook. But also, again, in that regard, not completely... Like concern, I know Brandon Bean spoke today and said that you know Hines won't really cut into Cook's workload too much, but I am very interested to see what the workload looks like. Devin Singletary has been the clear RB one this year, even when Moss has shown some flashes, even when Cook has shown some flashes, it's been a Devin Singletary led um, committee in that Bills backfield. And even if you're looking at it from a you know snap count perspective and snap share perspective, as I pull up some of the numbers. Here now for running backs on the entire year, uh, Devin Singletary is fifth in offensive snap rate at 70.5 for all running backs in the entire NFL. And then again, keep this number in mind because the Bills did have their bye week. He's fifth in offensive snaps for all running backs. This has been Devin Singletary's backfield for better or for worse. Although I do think it's uh, for better. He's had a he's had a good year. I don't think his workload gets eaten into too much behind by Hines, but it potentially could. I'm wondering what this rotation and snap share looks like. They were just starting to work in cook a little bit. Now you add this variable in Naheem Hines, um, who again, who I really like, I'm interested to see what it means for this backfield going forward this year and for next year as well with Devin Singletary being a UFA Hines having two more years under contract, but an out after this year. So Hines could easily be back next year or he could be gone. Same thing could be said for Devin Singletary, even though it's a bit of a different situation with him being a UFA. Either way, knock on wood, James Cook is probably here. So James Cook is trending upwards for me after this game against the Packers. I thought he had a strong game in both the run and the pass. We saw the elusiveness. We saw some better contact balance that he sh- than he showed earlier in the year and on tape at Georgia. We saw some positives. Again, I think he's still growing and still learning and still earning pieces um, in terms of reps and snaps on this offense, but I do think he's trending up. Um, so he's a big stock up for me. And another one in the stock up I mentioned earlier ties into the James Cook piece, this Bill's run game. I'm going to continue to shout it from the rooftops. This team is better when they are a gap scheme run team. Your pin and poles, your powers, your counters, all those pieces. This is the team on the year that, again, holistically, if you're looking at this Bills offense, they're fourth in total offensive DVOA for the year, which is awesome. They're second in passing DVOA, which is awesome. They're 25th in rushing DVOA. Their best run aspect of their team this year has still been Josh Allen. But what we've seen these last several weeks is they started to use more gap scheme. I mentioned it earlier. We've seen more success for the Buffalo Bills offense. Again, on the year, 61% zone usage rate, 34% gap. Against Green Bay this past week, 42% gap. The week before, well, two weeks before, against Kansas City Chiefs, 50% gap run rate. More pin and pulls, more Mitch Morse and Ryan Bates and Deion Dawkins out in space. Spencer Brown as well, once he comes back. Using power, using counter, again, 18%, 21 personnel usage rate 
on the year. That means more Reggie Gilliam on the field, which makes sense because you can line him up in a variety of places. He can function like an H-back and live in a tight end world, or he can line up in the backfield and give you traditional fullback reps and execution. So do they lean into that a little bit more in this game like they have? Because we've seen success, again, not against the potential like best run defenses in the league or best defenses in general in the league, but this Bills run game is trending up. And that's a huge piece for me as I continue to say it. I don't think the Bills need to be a run first team, but they need to have a good running game. However much that means. It could mean five carries. It could mean 15. It could mean 25, whatever have you. The Bills have to have the threat of the run to keep opposing defenses honest and have that threat. They need it in their game. Every team needs a pivot. Comes back to one of my central thesis thesis, thesi, whatever, for how football teams need to operate. Rock, paper, scissors. You need to be able to throw everything. It's awesome if you can come out and throw rock every week because your opponents are going to throw scissors and you can smash scissors every single time. But what happens when you come out throwing rock and you have an opponent that can throw paper? You got to pivot and you got to throw scissors. And that exists on both sides of the ball. But since we're focusing on offense here, that run game is that pivot. Whether you need it because of weather, whether you need it because of a good pass defense or a good pass rush or a weak run defense, and that's the easiest way to gash them and take advantage of the opponent, or because it's a team like the Chiefs and one you want to run the ball against them because they don't have a great run defense and you want to keep Chris Jones getting beat up on the interior and making him play where he doesn't want to play, which is defending the run, or you just want to grind out yards and the clock and keep the ball away from Patrick Mahomes. Those are just a couple examples. Having the pivot, having the option is nice to know that you can be like, oh, we have to run it this week? Okay, cool, we can run it. So it's nice to see the Bills being able to continue to put that together and have that semblance of the running game. Very encouraged, very excited by what the Bills have done these last several weeks in the run game. I'm excited to see what they do this week. Does that gap run usage rate continue to climb up like it has these last several weeks compared to what it's been on the year? And how do they fare against a run defense that has, by all accounts, been pretty good in the New York Jets, <clears throat> led by a defensive line that is physical and mean and nasty and technical as well. Let's go on the flip side a little. Let's talk about Oh, actually, let's pull up some comments here. Nick says Milano is dominating. Mahomes is still having nightmares of him and Vaughn. Oh, and Nick has another comment here from Nick. Nick says, keep Cook healthy and away. They're hiding him just like they did with Davis. Ooh. Oh, and Charles says, threat of the run is there 100% of the time with Josh at QB. I think that's fair. I don't want to have to put everything onto Josh Allen's shoulders. He already does a lot in the passing game and also having to evade pressure at times. I don't want to have to make him 99% of the offense all the time, at least not now in the regular season. If you want to run Josh 15 times and have him throw it 45 times and do it in the playoffs on the way to a Super Bowl, fine but I want to keep him as fresh as possible throughout the regular season. I don't want to have to push that button. I don't want to have to, you know, go to the break glass in case of emergency option until it's needed. So it'd be nice if they can have that pivot with the running back aspect of the running game. Oh, great comment here from Jason. He says, re-signing Milano last year now looks like one of the best bean deals so far. We have him locked in and underpaid for several years now. Um, as mean as it sounds to be happy that someone will be underpaid. Yeah, that's also too, like we're talking about this guy who's making like tens of millions of dollars and we're like, he's underpaid. But yeah, um, it's phenomenal to see him um, coming back. And great comment here from Carl as well. Milano's been amazing all year. He and Tremaine Edmonds have been very good, causing havoc at the second level. Yes, absolutely. They've been stalwarts. Um, and a lot of it, again, ties into the performance of the Bills defensive line, keeping them clean at the second level. So well done, well done. Stock down. Not holistically, and I know this is a piece that's a bit of a bit, a bit contentious for Bills fans. The Bills run defense against the Green Bay Packers. <clears throat> I will say, I do think some of it was game script related. You heard some of what Leslie Frazier said, some of what Von Miller said <clears throat> in terms of like thinking the Packers were going to pass at some point and the Packers were just content to keep running it for six, seven yards a clip when they were down three scores. So I don't want to say that the Bills let them run at the end because, one, I think it takes away from the execution that the Packers had in that game, which was genuinely good, and some of that execution that they showed in the first quarter and second quarter and first half when they weren't down by three scores. And also, like, nobody wants anybody to run the ball down their throat or have success. But I do think there is some of that game script piece where the Bills were content to a degree 
in letting the Packers run and then getting down into the red zone or into some situational aspects, whether it was third down or the red zone and tightening things up and then holding them to field goal attempts or, you know, really dialing things up and holding them no points at all. So I think there was a bit of some game script pieces to it, but the Packers offense had a really good game plan coming into this game. They were running some zone. They were running some gap. They had misdirection. They had split flow and zone. They had some eye candy that was used for legitimate reasons, not just for the sake of eye candy, like a Matt Canada Steelers offense. They executed well. There's a run. It's a counter run to Aaron Jones in the third quarter, fourth quarter, I think third quarter. And Packers are in 12 personnel, but they're in an I formation. Their second tight end is lined up as the fullback. And he motions, short motion to a strong eye formation. And what the Bills do is they shift. This is funny because Joe heard the siren in the background. Yeah, I'm a fire. Well played. What the Bills do is they see that motion and they shift. And the Packers know they're going to shift because the Bills do this. But as the Bills shift, Rodgers snaps the ball. So the Bills are moving this way, thinking that, okay, maybe it's going to be a wide zone, outside zone, even mid zone. Maybe it'll be that zone toss that the Packers have been running and working consistently in the, up to the game or in the game up to this point. But instead, that fullback motions to that side the tight end who's lined up as a fullback. We're going to call him a fullback for this instance. And then when the ball is snapped, stops and goes back to the other side. And Aaron Jones takes a false step this way and goes back to the other side because it's not an outside zone or that zone toss. It's a counter. And because the Bills have moved with that motion, they've set themselves up for failure. And now the Packers have set themselves up for success. They're able to easier execute their down blocks. The pullers that are coming through, they pull their tackle and they pull their fullback who go right up to the hole. They're able to easily go through that hole, turn, seal Tremaine Edmonds, get a nice clean gap for Aaron Jones to run through, and he gets a good gets a good chunk of yards first down, like a 12, 15-yard gain. Bills make the tackle. It was well designed. So I don't think the Bills are letting that happen. It was a good design from the Packers. My bigger concern is we've seen this from time to time last year and this year. Teams that are able to use motion, misdirection, and a variety of alignments and personnel in order to slow the Buffalo Bills defense down and or take advantage of their fast-flowing nature and aggressiveness. So I'm sitting there and thinking, again, maybe I'm I'm playing too much of the long con here, and I'm just using this as as an example, but if I'm a team like the Philadelphia Eagles and I'm going to play the Buffalo Bills in the Super Bowl, and the Eagles have such a diverse offense, especially in the run game, they were able to do a lot of what the Packers did in this game. I am the, the, The eye candy and the misdirection... And everything that you can do with that Eagles offense and attack through zone, that power zone aspect, or you want to go gap, whatever you want to do, let alone you have the added bonus of a weapon like Jalen Hurts, who's a huge threat on the ground. As they start to move forward, seeing some of these teams who can threaten the Bills in this way, I think it becomes a little bit of a concern. I don't think it's a sound the alarm, you know, red flag, everybody panic type of issue. Um, But the Packers had a good game plan and they executed that. The good news is the Bills have seen that again. Maybe that's something they add to their self-scouting repertoire um, in order to strengthen themselves as they move forward to the playoffs. So I don't think it's a complete panic. And even again, with it being stocked down, I mainly, I wanted to talk about it more because I know it's been a, you know, topic of conversation and consternation for Bills fans because some are, you know, it's game script. It was fine. They let it happen. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And then people on the other side think of this run defense was terrible. What the hell is going on? As always, it's very rarely one end of the spectrum or the other. It's usually in that gray. I think part of it, you have to tip your cap to the Packers for good execution um, and having a good game plan and beating the Bills um, individually, and also having the numbers advantage at at times uh, on offense. And when I say numbers advantage, I mean having even bodies, right? Because if you've got got five blockers for five defenders, you've got a body on a body, you've got a hat on a hat. But also, you always have one more gap than you have offensive linemen or guys on the line. So if you've got five offensive linemen, that's six gaps. If you've got five offensive linemen and a tight end, that's six bodies. That means you've got seven gaps, two tight ends on the line. That's seven bodies. You've got eight gaps, so on and so forth. So if you have equal numbers, if you've got five blockers for five defenders, that's advantage offense. If you get what I'm saying, even numbers are advantage offense. You can beat that if you're the defense by having somebody beat their man. 
somebody get has a quick get off, somebody gets penetration, somebody just executes well and beats their man at the first level or second level causes havoc. Maybe you bring a defender from another area, but if it's straight up even numbers, blockers for defenders in the box, you can beat that with individual play and execution, or you can have a numbers advantage and have as many defenders as there are gaps. So if there's five offensive linemen, that means there's six gaps. So you have six defenders in the box. What the Packers are doing is using motion and using alignments to pull defenders out. And so the bills would have, you know, seven defenders for six men on the line. So they're good with gaps. Packers come through and throw a motion pre-snap defender rotates out. And now you've got six defenders for six bodies, which means you only have six defenders for seven gaps. And the Packers were able to do that consistently and seeing if teams continue to pick at that going forward is an interesting piece. That's the only reason it was a stock down for me. Again, I do think like all things, it's a mixture of both. I think it was a bit of that game script and the bill kind of just being like, okay, take your six, seven yards, a clip, um, waste four, five, six, seven minutes a clock. And then when it comes down to the red zone, we'll tighten up, force a field goal, or try and get a sack and push you out and really make life difficult for you. And the Bills play well situationally on defense in this game. Um, but again, I don't think they just let them run all over them. But at the same time, I don't think they were playing for that aspect. I think they were very much playing for keep everything in front of us, bend but don't break, don't give up any touchdowns, keep this lead, or get more points on offense, which they should have. Josh Allen had some turnovers. I don't want to get into that aspect as of now, but – there's a lot of variables that led to the performance of the Bills' run defense in this game. But, um, again, it's a little bit of both. Don't panic. It wasn't terrible or as bad as you think it was, but also it wasn't nothing. Um, and, again, I think the tape speaks to that. And also, I like uh, granted, the Bills won, so I was able to enjoy it more. The Packers did some good stuff with their run game, and I'm very interested to see if teams lean into that aspect with those heavier personnel pieces, that misdirection, that motion, more split zone, um, and trying to confuse and pull Bill's defenders out of the box and then hitting them back in those vulnerable, vulnerable spots. So very interested, very interested. Carl's comment here. He's a stock down Zach Wilson. He is obvious the weak. He's obviously the weak link in this game. And then Von Miller, Groot, Ed Oliver, Shaq Lawson, getting pressure on Wilson early and often is the key to the game. I expect we win the turnover battle. I think that's fair. Um, Oh, Bills are third or fourth in takeaways this year, which is impressive considering they have had that bye week and two of the, their fourth. Two of the teams ahead of them have played eight games and one more game. So <clears throat> we'll see what they're able to do um, this week against the New York Jets, which will be a fun game for the AFC East against a team that is kind of an upstart team. I think they're still in that rebuilding and building things back up, but maybe got ahead of schedule a little bit by jumping out to that five and two record. And we'll see the jets test their metal this weekend against the Buffalo bills and going forward, like Zach Blatt mentioned earlier in this episode, as they have a difficult stretch coming up again, in terms of proving who they are on this year. But as I switch the banner now to toodles, you guys, that's going to do it for us here on this episode of Disguise Coverage. Please, before anyone goes, please, 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 and thank you, drop a like on this video. I know it's corny to ask for them. I know it's corny to say that it's corny and still ask for it. I do this every week. I know. I hate myself. Please drop a like on this video. It goes a long way towards helping the show and the brand and the channel track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. It legitimately affects the algorithm, pushes the show up the charts and rankings, um, and affects a lot of things. So please, 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 and thank you. If you enjoyed this episode and this content, please drop a like on this video. If you are listening on any one of the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review and subscribe. Subscribe here as well on YouTube. Oh, Joe, I see your comment down there. That's awesome, man. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's super cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, rate, review, subscribe, drop a like. Also, word of mouth is fantastic. Tell your family and friends and loved ones about this show um, and anything and everything pertaining to it. Or if you hated this show, tell your enemies and try and ruin their day. Um, everything that I like to say there, because if you use a view and listen to listen, although that isn't completely true, I'm, I'm big into quantity over quality, but I appreciate you folks nonetheless. Thank you very much to my guest tonight from The Athletic Mr. 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 Zach Rosenblatt, who was phenomenal insight into the jets. Um, dude who's covered a bunch of teams, covered the Eagles, he covered the giants. Now he's on the jets. Um, his honest and thoughtful analysis and insight into this team. Uh, it was cool. Cause one, it confirmed a lot of things that I initially thought and had in my notes, um, but also added some more perspective um, to this game and this matchup. 
Um, so thank you very much to Zach Rosenblatt at Zach Blatt on Twitter for joining me on this episode. Thank you all you folks for joining me live on this episode, the engagement with each other, the engagement with me. Thank you very much for the super chats, the multiple super chats that came through in this episode. Sincerely, like it's already awesome to have people wanting to hear what I have to say about something I'm so passionate about in the, with the game of football and the Buffalo bills. Um, but then also seeing people put like money behind it um, is a super cool thing. Um, and just having people joining me here in general. I know the time isn't always great. It's 7 p.m. on the East Coast. It's 4 p.m. on the West Coast. It's weird. Like, are you done with dinner? Are you hanging out with the family? Are you tucked in for the night? Are you still running around? It's a weird variable time. So seeing all the people who pile in uh, to join me here live and then comment with each other, comment with me and go back and forth in a good way um, and have a good football conversation I truly appreciate all you folks. So thank you for riding with me live on this episode. For those of you that didn't, that is cool too. I appreciate your post live view, your listen, whatever and wherever your support comes from. It is greatly appreciated and tremendously um, acknowledged by myself and the entire team. Please drop a like on this video if you're watching on YouTube. Please rate and review if you are listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms. Subscribe regardless whether you're on YouTube or the podcasting apps or platforms. Thank you very much for joining me. And this has been another episode of Disguise Coverage. Go get yourself some one pie pizza and order the Allen Goat, the official pizza now of Disguise Coverage. It is the Disguise Coverage Allen Goat, the cover one Allen Goat. They named a pizza after this show. I'm thrilled. And I'm even more thrilled to try this pizza again. Red sauce, goat cheese, chicken fingers, mozzarella cheese, red onion, and bacon. The Allen Goat. Because it's got goat cheese in it and because Alan maybe is the goat, fantastic pizza coming from our folks and friends over at One Pie Pizza. The online menu can be found in the episode show notes. Go get yourself some of the Alan goat. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. Be kind to everyone and anyone. Pay it forward. All that kind of good stuff and niceties and good things. I will see you next week for another episode of Disguise Coverage live Wednesday at 7 p.m. Again, Appreciate all you folks. Oh, and Dobbs, great plug. He says, I'm going to the Cover One Heinz film room. Bye. That's also an awesome plug. Myself and Kendall Mursky dove into some Naheem Hines film last night in the Cover One film room and broke down the Bills offensive performance against the Packers in the full episode of the Cover One film room. And then we launched the Naheem Hines portion as its own individual episode tonight for a special Cover One uh, film room episode. So if you want to see some game film on Naheem Hines and what he brings with his skill set and traits of the Buffalo Bills offense, Go on over and check that special individual about half hour episode on Naheem Hines or check out the entire film room episode and get some Naheem Hines action and the Packers uh, Packers versus Bills game film from the Bills offensive perspective with the run game, balance, Josh Allen, all that stuff. I love what Bill says. I'm going to leave it up here. He says, be excellent to each other. I will see you folks next week. Thank you for all your support, whatever form and fashion it comes in. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the regular weekend ramping up after ramping down from Halloween and ramping up going to Thanksgiving in this month. I will see you next week. Godspeed. And as always, go Bills.